All right, so this is going to be uh, the outline of my talk. I'm going to introduce redox biology, hopefully begin to introduce what the other speakers are talking about a little bit. I'm um, going to talk about mitochondria as the major source of en endogenous oxidative stress in cells. Um, talk a little bit about mitochondrial function and biochemistry associated with feed efficiency. And I've got this one in a different color because a week ago Thursday, I found a recent paper on uh, reverse electron flow. Um, so I basically jettisoned a whole bunch of stuff out of the talk so I could uh, introduce this because this is relatively new in mitochondrial biology. Um, proton leak uh, is used, it, it attenuates mitochondrial ROS production. Um, some studies that we've done now showing that progesterone may be involved in feed efficiency, a summary, and then if I have time, I've got what I'm putting down here as a mitochondrial surprise. So redox biology. So my perspective on antioxidants and glutathione for many years was this. Basically, glutathione was the center of the antioxidant uh, universe. But there, uh, I've gotten a greater appreciation, and I've become a full-fledged mitochondriac. Um, so, a little bit different view. You have non-enzymatic antioxidants. Uh, this includes vitamin E, vitamin C, vitamin A, uh, uric acid, and glutathione, and en enzymatic antioxidants. But in my view, glutathione is still at the center of the table. So, if you look at this table, you've, you've got uh, detoxification, uh, formation of uh, uh, epoxides that are radicals uh, uh, by P450 metabolism. There's radicals generated through inflammation. Um, there's radicals being generated uh, in muscle differentiation. Mitochondria isn't the center because they're producing lots of radicals uh, as a consequence or in addition to um, ra uh, oxidative phosphorylation. You can also have peroxyl and nitrosa radicals. Over here on the right are a bunch of cofactors that are used for many of the enzymatic antioxidants. So I've got those as forks, knives, and spoons. Uh, metallothionine is very important in sequestering uh, ions. You don't want free metal ions ro roaming around because this will cause uh, oxidation. So it's an antioxidant table with an oxidant feast. But if they don't clean them all up, then, then you get into a situation where you've got DNA damage, uh, protein oxidation, lipid peroxidation, autophagy, mitophagy, apoptosis, etc. You have to have a whole lot of ATP uh, invested in, a, in order to clean this up. So it's a very expensive process. So glutathione is at the center of a whole lot of redox coupling. Uh, glutathione is in millimolar uh, concentrations in virtually all cells, um, and so it's a very central to this. And I know that uh, subsequent speakers are going to be talking about uh, selenium with uh, glutathione peroxidase. Um, so there's, there's many of these uh, um, redox-coupled reactions, and it should be recognized that glutathione is also very beneficial in uh, regenerating uh, vitamin E or tocopherol from oxidized form dehydroascorbate back to vitamin C. So it's very central to, to much of the antioxidant protection. So this is electron micrograph of a mitochondria. Uh, the electron transport chain is on the inner mitochondrial membrane, but the mitochondria, it sort of gives a false sense of what the mitochondria look like. So this is a scanning electron uh, tomography, and you get more of a sense of this three-dimensional structure. So these are the Christi. Rather than seeing just the nice little Christi in the electron micrograph, they're, they're three-dimensional. Uh, the endoplasmic reticulum surrounds the mitochondria, so this facilitates a lot of the transport of things uh, in and out of the mitochondria. Uh, and the, the mitochondria are sausage-shaped, uh, and they, they extend throughout uh, the cell, and they're not static. They don't just sit there in one place. They divide, they uh, fuse, and they can move around in the cells. So this is uh, kind of going to be a quick overview of mitochondrial biology. Just noting this, glutathione is synthesized in the cytosol, and it's imported into the mitochondria. The mitochondria can't make their own uh, glutathione. 
So it participates in the glutathione recycling uh, reaction for de uh, antioxidant protection. Now, on the top and the bottom of this are electron transport chains, and I show it with the different complexes. Um, substrates can either enter in from succinate, FADH linked on the top, or NADH linked substrates on the bottom. These are multi protein uh, complexes, and so they, they consist of uh, nuclear encoded proteins as well as mitochondrial DNA encoded proteins. And so they have to be constructed uh, in, in order to get optimal activity of the complexes. Then, as oxidative phosphorylation occurs, electrons move down the electron transport chain. You get pro proton pumping uh, across uh, into uh, the intermembrane space. And then when the protons flow back through ATP synthase, this is what generates the energy for ATP production. But AD, ATP and ADP, they have to shuttle in and out of the mitochondria, and they do this with a combination of a couple of proteins. It's ANT is adenine nucleotide translocase, and then VDAC is voltage-dependent activated channel. What happens with oxidated phosphorylation is that electrons leak out of the electron transport chain. They do univalent reduction of oxygen to form superoxide, and the superoxide can then uh, form additional uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. The white shark of the uh, reactive oxygen species is hydroxyl radical. And a lot of it, like metallothionine and some of these other things, the reason that they're there is to sequester iron and copper, so you don't get uh, hydroxyl radical formation. Um, one thing that also goes on in the mitochondria is a thing called proton leak, and proton leak dissipates the membrane potential. A higher membrane potential results in higher ROS production. And so the proton leak, it's a self-limiting uh, system within the mitochondria to try to lower the amount of electrons that are leaking out. If oxidation continues, then you can have formation of oxidized glutathione, the GSSG. This gets to um, where you can have protein disulfides forming. These are damaged. So you end up with protein damage, so they're not doing what they need to be doing. And then the reactive oxygen species, they can cause damage, especially hydroxyl radical, it, it nails anything uh, that it bumps into. But you can have oxidation going on of all the structures uh, around it. And then finally, you get signal transduction. So you can modulate uh, uh, gene expression through uh, ROS production. So this is, this is a quick little paradigm. We've been working on uh, feed efficiency for some time. So this was done in conjunction with Cobb Vantress in a pedigree uh, male broiler line. Um, so at six weeks of age, uh, they took 100 birds, put them in individual cages, did uh, individual phenotyping. And then what we did is we took the top and eight and the bottom eight from this, and this is basically what we've uh, been using in our studies. Um, just to put this down, and, uh, there's a big difference in feed efficiency. So it was 0.8 in the high feed efficient group and 0.61 in the low feed efficient group. So a very large difference in feed efficiency. So this is oxidative phosphorylation. Electrons enter, as I said, from malate or NADH linked or succinate. And the electrons flow from complex one to three or complex two to three. And this shuttling is carried out by coenzyme Q and then it flows down until the, uh, it gets to uh, reducing oxygen to uh, water. So that's in a uh, quick summary. Along the way, hydrogen ions gets pumped, sets up proton motor force, and that's what's driving ATP synthesis. But what's electron leak? Basically, electron leak is these, they get fumbled. The, all of these proteins, it's not 100% that they're able to transmit the electrons down the transport chain. So they get fumbled, and when they do, they react with oxygen to form superoxide that's converted to hydrogen peroxide by superoxide dismutase and formation of uh, reactive oxygen species. 
to magnify this or to locate where these defects are occurring, you can put in chemical inhibitors. Uh, rotenone is used to block complex one, and then uh, anamycin A or mixothiazole uh, can block at complex three. Now, in the, when this started, this started in the 70s and pretty much through the uh, 2000s. Um, it was basically all ROS were bad, they were causing damage, and that was the end of the story. Um, and I'm gonna show you in a little bit that that's not always the case. So this is a study we did, this is in breast muscle mitochondria. Um, we had a basal condition, no inhibitor, or we treated isolated mitochondria with various inhibitors. And so the low feed efficient, which are in the open bars, we saw uh, increase in reactive oxygen species from complex one and complex three uh, compared to the high feed efficient phenotype. So there were defects in electron transport in the low feed efficient mitochondria. We did a, a number of tissues along the way, and so this is looking at basal radical production. And in, in, in breast muscle, duodenum, and liver, and in all cases except in uh, leg muscle mitochondria, we saw higher basal radical production. Uh, in the low feed efficient mitochondria. The increased radical production resulted in increased protein carbonyl formation. Protein carbonyls are oxidized proteins. So the first uh, bar up there is for breast muscle mitochondria, big difference in protein oxidation. And then the others are other tissues. All of them had higher uh, protein oxidation in these homogenates than in uh, low feed efficient compared to high feed efficient. So there's basically a uh, pervasive oxidative stress uh, going on in the low feed efficient uh, broilers. This is just a reminder, all of these, uh, the electron transport chain, they're all enzyme complexes, and so you can measure these with various enzymatic assays. This is uh, just one uh, example, this was in duodenal uh, mitochondria, uh, activities were higher in high feed efficient for all of the complexes except for complex four in this particular case. Um, uh, glutathione, it's got a very important thiol group in it and it helps stabilize uh, complexes and so we looked at relationships between mitochondrial glutathione and activity and with complex two, four, and five we had higher we had correlations between glutathione in the mitochondria and complex activity. So it helps uh, maintain the complex activity. And then we found an inverse correlation between activity and protein carbonyl formation. So more protein carbonyls, lower activity of the enzyme complex. When we looked across several tissues, uh, this is the, the dotted line that's across there. Uh, this is uh, being compared, that's the level set for uh, high feed efficient, and then we compared it to a percentage in low feed efficient. In almost all cases, complex activity was lower in low feed efficient compared to high feed efficient. And so we, th we think that that was possibly due to higher protein oxidation. All right, so now I wanna to get to this uh, uh, mitochondrial reverse electron flow. And so I, this is what I, I found this paper a week ago Thursday on mitochondrial ele uh, reverse electron transport flow. I knew this talk was coming up and I thought, well, I gotta find out what the heck that is. Um, so, uh, and also I had this reaction, reverse what? Because the dogma had been that reverse electron flow was an artifact of in vitro preparations. It didn't happen in the real world. This paper is loaded with things where it's happening in the real world. So this is showing, this is a diagram showing forward electron transport. This is how oxida uh, oxidative phosphorylation is occurring, and, you, and it's showing a certain amount of radical production going on at complex one. <clears throat> This is reverse electron flow, and what they're looking at, it, it's sensed by the reduction state of coenzyme Q. And what happens is, in this particular case, electrons are flowing 
back from complex two to complex one. And so it enhances radical production. And so, the, so you get radical pr production occurring at two different sites in complex one. This is going back, we did, this is intestinal mitochondria and we'd been looking at ra Ross production. And when, at the time that we had this and we had this data, I thought this was, could be an artifact uh, uh, showing the big increase with inhibition at complex two with the TTFA. There was a big increase. Snuck the paper in, it got accepted, so I was like, okay, that was cool. Um, but wh what I wish we would have done in this case is that if we had done this study with rotenone, we, we might have found and been able to conclusively say this was due to uh, reverse electron flow. But possibly in uh, duodenal mitochondria, reverse electron flow could be occurring. And we expected a big increase from complex three uh, when we were feeding these uh, uh, mitochondria with succinate. But instead we saw it at complex two, and that's why the question is, could reverse electron transport flow be going on? So from the, from the paper, this is something that is, I find extremely interesting, because there's a topology that's involved in how and where the electrons are leaking out of the mitochondria. So from complex one, which is at the bottom, there is a Ross production, electron leak re resulting in Ross production. And it, this electron leak goes primarily into the mitochondrial ma matrix, and it's primarily associated with oxidative damage. But from complex three, the third one up there, it, it gets released, the electrons get released mostly into the Christie space, in the intermembrane space, and it has, it's predominantly involved in signal transduction. It has some uh, oxidative component, but when these are separated out, complex one was primarily, or yeah, complex one was primarily involved in oxidative stress. Complex three is where signal transduction is being uh, induced. And this is a really interesting paper. We're all aging. As we're sitting here, every one of us are aging. And they've, they've, there's a long been held a, a free radical uh, reactive oxygen species involvement in uh, aging. But this, this uh, paper talks about um, the abundance of this matrix arm that I've circled there of uh, involved in radical formation. And so basically, in, in a case where there's disruption of complex one, so there's lower, for example, lower expression of uh, proteins in complex one, the, the lower abundance results in higher radical formation. And they tied this to cell senescence as well as longevity in mice. So the shorter that matrix arm is in complex one, uh, more radicals being produced and this can stimulate aging. So here's another one. Uh, we have inflammation in all kinds of different models, different things we're looking at. This is looking at macrophages and the reverse electron flow from complex two to complex one, according to this paper, is saying this is where the radical uh, reactive oxygen species are being produced. So in a pro-inflammatory macrophage, you end up with, in, in, for example, in response to bacterial infection, there's this reorganization of the electron transport chain. And so it decreases complex one, but it enhances complex two. And in the process of doing this, it shifts ATP from oxidative phosphorylation to the glycolytic pathway, and it leads to a high mitochondrial membrane potential. And when there's a higher mitochondrial membrane potential, you get more radicals being produced. So there's a buildup of succinate, and it does reverse electron transport flow. And this is where uh, the electrons are leaking, form forming superoxide and high levels of hydrogen peroxide. If you treat these macrophages with rotenone, it, it basically puts it into uh, anti-inflammatory mac macrophage. Oh, and the other thing on the inflammatory macrophages, this stimulates inflammatory cytokines. With rotenone, you get, you get inhibition of reverse electron flow. Uh, this decreases Ross production, and 
Instead of inflammatory cytokines being produced, you now get anti-inflammatory cytokines. So it's a, it's, a different, it's a different cell, it's a different beast at this point, and it's shifted it, and the shift is based on reverse electron flow. Here's another one, ischemia reperfusion injury. Esche this is in heart attack. So with ischemia, you have low blood flow, low oxygen levels. Uh, the top is ischemia and the bottom is uh, uh, normoxia. So in normoxia, in heart muscle and in other muscle, you'll have uh, electron transport, oxidative phosphorylation going on. But in ischemia, there's a buildup of AMP and succinate. When blood flow re is restored to the tissue, now you have a buildup of succinate uh, in, the, in that tissue, and it's going to run uh, into the electron transport chain the other way, so that you get, now you've got reverse electron flow. You get Ross production, and this is what they are saying, that the great amount of damage is occurring is from reverse electron flow once uh, normoxia is restored. I teach an uh, undergraduate physiology course. I, and we talk about sensing of oxygen uh, in the animal from the carotid body chemoreceptors. In this one, if there are low levels of uh, reactive oxygen species, uh, now let me, let me back up. When there's hypoxia, what happens is there's a buildup of reactive oxygen species in NADH. And this buildup uh, stimulates uh, the potassium channels in uh, the glomus cell, which is the sensing cell of hypoxia, and it increases activity from the sensory nerve. So oxygen sensing comes down to uh, another case where there's reverse electron flow resulting in stimulation of respiration. So for all of us who are dealing with muscle in one way, shape, or form, because we're always wanting to eat uh, chicken, etc. So this is, uh, this has to do with uh, muscle cell differentiation. And, and the conclusion from this paper is that during, uh, that a re a reverse electron transport is running to produce cytokines, I mean to produce uh, ROS, that end up um, stimulating muscle cell differentiation. So reverse electron flows is in that transition uh, in muscle development. How many exercise in here on a regular basis? One, two, there ought to be more. Ought to be more of you. <laughs> uh, because this shows, okay, in exercise, you, in, during exercise, you lower mitochondrial membrane potential. You have less uh, reactive oxygen species being produced. When that's occurring, you get mitochondrial biogenesis, and you can get fusion going on in the mitochondria, and you get these various uh, genes that are being involved in this uh, uh, activity. Get greater antioxidant capacity, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, improve mitochondrial function, there's greater cell survival, and muscle adaptation. If you're a couch potato, what ends up happening, you have a higher membrane potential, you have high levels of ROS that are coming out, and you stimulate something completely different, and this can lead to mitochondria that are not functioning op optimally, and you have mitophagy, uh, and a lot of things that are going on in, in uh, cell turnover. So it's two different things, and it's, re it's related to reverse electron flow. So now I'm just going to touch on proton leak. We did a, uh, some studies with proton leak kinetics, and the bottom line with this is what we found is that in all the different situations where we're looking at proton leak kinetics, uh, that proton leak was uh, e less than or equal to, uh, it, it was uh, in the high feed efficient mitochondria, proton leak was less than or equal to, but never greater than in the low efficient mitochondria. And so what this seems to be saying is that this proton leak uh, was being stimulated by the higher ROS production that's going on in low feed efficient mitochondria. So now, jump forward a little bit. We've been doing some proteogenomics uh, genomics studies, and we've done this looking uh, at breast muscle samples. We did a uh, CDA, cDNA microarray. We've done RNA-seq most recently, as well as sh uh, shotgun proteomics. All of these studies were done on the same tissue samples. So we're looking at the same 
Uh, they came from birds that either had high feed efficient phenotype or low feed efficient phenotype. And I have to take a second and just uh, thank some people. I would never have been, even thought of doing this stuff if it hadn't been for Dr. Kong, uh, bioinformatics. Uh, kind of, he, he's got four screens there because he's got to do this stuff all the time. Um, I have, admire that. Nick Hudson contacted me a couple years ago and we, we ended up getting funded by USDA um, and we, we had Tony Reverter who's a statistician and what they said with, with the RNA-seq data, rather than using a cutoff that most people are using, they said, give me all the data. I said, you're nuts, but they wanted all the data, so we sent it to them. And they came up with, uh, well, they, they had developed this thing called regulatory impact factor analysis. I'm not gonna go into this. Um, I, I, basically, they're described in these papers. Um, and it has to do with a, a differential wiring analysis. You can have a gene that could be having a big effect on the phenotype through its interconnectedness, but you don't see it if you're doing the cutoff with a fold or a uh, difference or a p-value. So they just took all of the data. Whoops, oh good. So they did the regulatory impact factor analysis and, and through this analysis, they came up with progesterone signaling is playing an important role in feed efficiency. And we just published this a couple months ago in uh, BMC uh, Systems Biology. So five or four out of the top 10 uh, regulatory impact factors had to do something with, with progesterone. We, in the proteomics uh, paper that we did, we also found that uh, progesterone was predicted to be activated in the high feed efficient phenotype. And I want to point out here that also there, there appears to be insulin and triiodothyronine uh, uh, that are predicted to be activated. So why, these are immature male broilers, why progesterone, why in the muscle? So I started looking and found a couple of papers that talked about uh, hormonal involvement in mitochondrial function. So when we co I compared what we had found with mitochondrial function uh, in the comparison high and low feed efficiency to what they found with progesterone in a couple of these different models. Uh, and it had to, the progesterone was protective of mitochondrial function in ischemic, uh, in um, traumatic brain injury. So they, in feed efficiency, they had higher uh, coupling, higher uh, respiratory control ratio lower state four, uh, we had lower ROS production, that was also seen, lower electron leak uh, in the uh, brain studies, lower oxidative stress, and there was a higher complex uh, four activity. We saw a, a number of complexes, all of the complexes were basically lower or, or higher in high feed efficiency. So progesterone seems to be having an effect in the central nervous system similar to what we were seeing with the mitochondria in high and low feed efficiency. And then this led to a whole bunch of papers. They've known this in mammals for some time. We looked in the literature, but we didn't see anything in avian cells that this had been documented. It doesn't mean it's not out there, we just haven't found it yet. So Kentu Laster, and I can't uh, say enough about what he's been doing. He's been working with me for a long time. Thank goodness, don't go anywhere. Uh, Otherwise, I'm, I'm out of work. Anyway, so he did these studies. This is in QM7 cells, looking at uh, expression of receptors on the mitochondria. So this is progesterone receptor uh, using immunofluorescence, and the merged figure at the bottom is indicating the presence of uh, these receptors on mitochondria. So we got it in these QM7 cells with progesterone, glucocorticoid, thyroid hormone, and insulin receptor. And he presented on Tuesday most recent findings, uh, which was estrogen also being located in these QM7 cells. And importantly, uh, he was, he'd been trying to uh, identify through Western uh, blood analysis the, the presence of these hormones. He had a lot of uh, uh, nonspecific bindings, so it wasn't clear. He got a monoclonal, and now we have a very clear uh, indication that estrogen receptor is located in, uh, on the mitochondria because this is the mitochondrial fraction. 
So now I want to return to redox biology. And nuclear respiratory factor is, uh, it orchestrates a cell response to oxidative stress. So it stimulates the antioxidant response element in the nucleus to help with preparing the cell or conditioning the cell to oxidative stress. This is a real simple diagram, but in a normal situation, NERF2, NFE2L2, is bound to a couple of regulatory molecules, KEEP1 and CULIN3. It's bound if no oxidative stress is present. It turns over every 10 to 15 minutes uh, through proteasomal degradation. If oxidative stress is occurring, it breaks these bonds that are holding on to NFE2L2. It then goes into the nucleus, stimulates antioxidant response element, that stimulates the production of antioxidant enzymes and uh, antioxidants in the cell to respond to the oxidative stress. So in the shotgun proteomics, we found uh, that it was predicted to be activated in the high feed efficient. The orange is indicative of activation in the high feed efficient phenotype. And uh, Nan Zhao, uh, who was, did a master's with Ben Bosch, they found this with RNA-seq in a uh, broiler, commercial broiler model. So they also found that they were, it was predicted to be activated in high feed efficiency. So these, were, these predictions were made, but, but the molecules, the downstream molecules upon which the prediction was made were different between the two sets. So there's a, a slight difference there, but the prediction was the same. So possibly this activation or upregulation of NERF2 uh, in the high feed efficient broilers helps orchestrate or respond. It prepares these high feed efficient cells to handle oxidative stress better than the ones, than the low feed efficient. It's a hypothesis at this point. NERF2 is very transient. It's very hard to measure these things because it's, it's changing very rapidly over time. So here's kind of a summary that I've got. I hope I've, you know, the importance of redox biology and oxidative stress talked a little bit about electron transport, mitochondrial ROS production, and how that's attenuated by proton leak. Um, mitochondrial reverse electron transport. Uh, I, I really think that these papers in the last three or four years are highlighting something new that has fundamental importance to what every one of us are doing. Um, we see that there's a possible role of progesterone uh, that could be uh, involved in feed efficiency. And then it could be the antioxidant response may be coordinated by NFE2L2. So now I want to, these are a couple other things that we've published recently. How am I doing on time? Almost up. Almost up. I'm get, he's getting the hook out. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is some other stuff that we've, we've published. Martin Brand uh, recently published this. There's not just three sites of electron leak, there's now 10 sites. So now these are different sites that are within the mitochondria. They designed a couple of raw suppressors that are targeted, these are antioxidants that are tar targeting specific parts of the electron transport chain. But they, the cool thing about this, it does not prevent normal electron flow. One last thing, the mitochondria may be playing a role in uh, fixing damaged proteins. And this is a paper that came out in March. Um, they named this uh, mitochondria as garden, uh, guardian in cytosol or magic. So just leaving you with a little bit of mitochondrial magic. Thank you. <laughs>